Welcome to the first in our new Pixhawk series. In this series we're going to set up the Pixhawk and configure it in a similar way to what we've done with other flight controllers, particularly the APM. For those of you that have been watching for a while, you'll know that the way it tends to work is the first couple of videos in the series cover basic setup, and then as we go through, we start to cover more sophisticated topics and subjects, so by the end of maybe about 10 to 12 videos, you know everything you need to know to get the board working really well. Interspersed with those videos, we tend to have quick tips which will explain specific little things and tend to be related to subscriber questions about things that maybe don't understand or that haven't been covered in some of the other videos. So we're going to cover a lot in the first video. We're going to set up in this series this Pixhawk on a quadcopter and we're going to connect it to a Tronis radio and we're going to configure it from scratch. So if you have a brand new Pixhawk board and you're wondering what you do, if you follow these videos, it should get you up and working. First thing I need to do is say a very big thank you to one of my subscribers, uh, I'll just refer to him as R, who sent me this Pixhawk to do the video series with. Thank you again R, this is all down to you, so I'm sure my subscribers will join me in thanking you for taking the time to pop this in the mail for me. We'll also talk about the differences between the Pixhawk and the APM. I've had a lot of questions about that and we'll cover it at a reasonably high level. If you want to go and find out more detail, I'll link to the website in the description where you can go and read all about it, but we'll cover why we're looking at the Pixhawk as opposed to the APM. Then we'll talk about how we connect up things like the GPS external compass module, the buzzer, the press button, and the receiver and then we'll go and we'll flash the firmware onto the board and get it so that it's configured with the radio and ready to start installing other cables onto the model. So this is probably going to be a reasonably long video so I would suggest that you get comfortable, get yourself a drink and settle in because the first thing we'll talk about is APM and Pixhawk and why we have two boards that run similar software. For those of you that have been on the channel for a while, you'll know that the APM, which is the Pixhawk predecessor, has been one of my favourite boards for some time. It provides super stable smooth flying, perfect for aerial video and mission flying, and it has the best GPS implementation of the boards that we've played with on the channel. So you can do things like GPS return to home, the GPS hold is fabulous, and you can also program individual waypoints into the software and allow it to fly missions autonomously. And the PIC Talk you can think of as the new version of the APM. So the APM is an 8 bit device, has been around for quite a while now. It's very mature and rock solid, but the amount of code and processing that's been crammed into the software that's going onto these boards is now running the processor inside the APM at 90 plus percent pretty much all the time. So the Pixhawk has come around as the new kid on the block. It's been around for a little while now, and if you want a platform that's going to be a bit more future-proof than the APM, this is a great choice. It provides everything that the APM does, but will also continue to support the latest and greatest versions of firmware and features as they're released via the software. So let's just talk a little bit about the differences between APM and Pixhawk under the covers. First thing we need to think about is that we didn't go straight from APM to Pixhawk. It wasn't a smooth delivery. There was actually an intermediate step called the PX4, and the PX4 became the Pixhawk with some changes to the pinouts and a little bit of the setup. So you may also hear about people talking about PX4 and Pixhawk, but we're talking about this Pixhawk board, which is the iteration where it has everything set out and it has all of these connectors on the top. So it's a piece of cake to connect it to all of your sensors, external components, receiver and everything else. So the APM 2.5, 2.6 and things like the APM Mini 3.1s, so basically all the APM 2s and 3s, actually have an 8-bit controller. So this is very mature technology now and it only runs at about 16 megahertz. has about 8 kilobytes of RAM and about 256 kilobytes of flash. The flash is where the image for the firmware is stored. RAM is used for on-the-go computation and flying the craft. 
On board the APM, it has an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a barometer, and the APM 2.6 and the later versions had an external magnetometer or compass that would allow you to get the compass away from some of the high power electronics and stop any interference. The last firmware that's supported by APM is APM Copter 3.2.1 that came out in May. So all of the later versions after 3.2.1 will not install onto an APM platform. You can see the leap in technology when we look at the PixHawk system. It's actually now a 32-bit processor as opposed to 8-bit and it's running much, much faster, 168 megahertz. The RAM's increased dramatically from 8K to 256K. The flash has increased dramatically too, from 256K to 2 meg of flash. And it is bristling with sensors. Gyroscopes, accelerometers, magnetometers, accelerometers, gyroscopes, barometers. It will support an external magnetometer, which is how we'll run it here, but there is redundancy built into the PixHawk system. So the way it works is the software is actually looking at the two different accelerometers, the two different magnetometers, the two different gyroscopes, and actually f trying to figure out if any of the readings are in error. So that means that if one of the sensors has a little bit of a hiccup, it doesn't crash your entire craft. It will obviously run the latest version of the software, so whatever version is available, the latest and greatest will drop straight onto the PixHawk, no problem. And there are tons of extra features, and we'll cover some of these as we go through the video series, and you can go onto the website, the um, Arducopter website, and have a look at these, but to kind of whet your appetite, we can do things like now redundant power and sensors. We talked a little bit about the sensors, but the fact you can have redundant power systems with PixHawk is great because that means if a power system starts to have a problem, again, it won't bring your craft down. It has an SD card for storage. So if I just jump back to the table, at the end of the case, we have the SD card. That's used for all kinds of different things, including log file storage, but I would always make sure that that is absolutely pressed home before we plug it into a computer. Not having that SD card pressed home will uh, cause you to have connection problems. It also has things like the uh, redundant sensors that we've covered. And in software, there's tons of new stuff coming. One of the ones that I get asked around a lot is something called the EKFs, or the extended Kalman filters. Now, because of the extra horsepower inside the PixHawk, they can write the code to do a lot more computation on each loop. So rather than having the slower processor on the APM slow down the amount of processing that you can do, on the PixHawk, because the processor is so much more powerful and so much faster, then you can actually use the extended Kalman filters to use that extra CPU horsepower to get to the answers faster. So you can look up extended Kalman filter. We will talk about it later in the series, but the bottom line is we have loads of new stuff coming in the firmware that, and software that's going to make this a board for the future. So the first thing we're going to have to do then is start to plug some of this stuff in. So we're going to plug the GPS in first. Now the GPS itself with a PixHawk, just like the APM 2.6, has two connectors. It has one that goes into the GPS connector, which is this one on the left, and then the one on the right goes into the I2C connector. That is the external compass. On top of the board, all of these are carefully labelled. So first of all, we'll plug the GPS cable into the GPS connector, and then we'll plug the external magnetometer into the I2C connector. Second thing we need to do then is we need to install the receiver. Now the receiver is only supported on the PixHawk using either SBUS or CPPM. So you, there's only one input cable for the RC in. This SBUS thing at the side is actually for SBUS out if you're using SBUS, not to connect SBUS to. So I'm going to use an FRSky D4R2 receiver and I'm going to connect my CPPM cable into the RC in. Be careful, you're observing polarity. And now we are ready to plug this into the computer. So we're going to use a micro USB and we're going to plug this into the PC, install and run something called Mission Planner, 
and then we're going to flash the firmware and do the configuration. So just before I flick to the netbook, here is the Pixhawk ready to go. What I've done is actually connected it and the external GPS and compass module to a little bit of card. The reason for that is that as part of the setup, we are gonna to have to move things around. And because there are so many redundant sensors in both the Pixhawk and additional sensors here in the external GPS, I want them aligned the same way. So what we've done is we've made sure that the two arrows on both of the devices are pointing in the same direction. And then that, as I move things around to teach the software and the Pixhawk what level up, down, left, right, etc., feels like, it won't be getting conflicting information from the two sets of sensors. There are two other things I've plugged in just before we plug it into the PC. The first one I've plugged into the buzzer. This is gonna let us hear how happy or not the Pixhawk is. It's very straightforward. It fits into the input called buzzer. And then the other one is this one, which is the safety switch. Now we'll talk about how this works later in the series, but this is something, it's a little tactile switch with a little uh, red light in it that shows you if the Pixhawk is armed or not. And it makes sure that you can only arm the craft when you're absolutely ready. This could be mounted on the outside of a plane or normally it's gonna be mounted on a nice, easy to get to, easy visible part of a multicopter. Now plug those two both in as well. And the only other thing that we've got ready is a little set square, and that's so that we can make sure when we do the calibration of the accelerometers, we're holding it at exactly 90 degrees. Okay, now we're ready. We have our USB cable to plug in when we get to that point, but now we go to the netbook. So on the netbook, we've downloaded and installed Mission Planner. So if you haven't got that already, and you're not coming to APM and Pixhawk land uh, from APM, then this will be new to you. So the Ardu Pilot site, ardupilot.com, has all of the information, drivers, software, and on it to set up your APM and your Pixhawk. What you do is go to download, download Mission Planner, and then if you go to the very bottom of the new window, you'll find there's a link here to Mission Planner Installer. Now I've already installed that and it's running. So here's Mission Planner ready on my machine, and we're going to plug our Pixhawk in for the very first time. I would recommend here that when you're plugging it into your computer, make sure it's a USB port that can handle the higher current ratings. Typically you'll find USB ports have either a low current rating just for data flow, and uh, some will be rated up to anything up to about half an amp. You wanna make sure you're on one of the larger ones. Okay, so let's plug it in. So on the computer, it's saying installing device driver software. It's saying hello. We're going to skip obtaining the driver from Windows Update. The reason is we want to download and install the drivers here locally. That's going to save us a lot of time. While it's installing the drivers, let me point out a couple of things here. You can see that it's powering the Pixhawk from the USB. We have all the lovely flashing lights. We also have the pulsing light I don't know if you can see that very well, there we go, on the switch. It's also powered the GPS, we have a red light on that, and it's also powered our receiver. So it's pulling quite a bit of current from our USB port, which is why we need that higher current. But it now means that we don't need to apply any other power while we're going to set this up. And then from initial setup, we're going to click on install firmware, and it'll go to the internet, it'll get all the latest firmware versions, and it'll talk to us. Now the trick here is that we need to make sure that whatever COM port the board is connected to, we have selected. Now it'll usually give you a big clue in that when you select the drop down box, it'll actually show you that we have COM6, it's a PX4 flight controller. So uh, we know that's the one we need to do. Now you don't connect, you just let the computer know that that's the target that we're going to. Now here are all the different firmware versions that we can get on a rover, a plane, helicopter, antenna tracker, and every type of multi-rotor you can shake a stick at. So what we would do is if we wanted to install this firmware, we would just click on top of this image. It would then download the firmware. Once it's ready, tell us to disconnect and reconnect the board and then flash the firmware completely. Once the firmware is flashed, it'll then reboot the board and then you can then connect to do the next pieces. 
This process is very automatic. It's very straightforward. Just click on the picture that you're interested in and follow the on-screen instructions for it to install the firmware. The firmware will take about five or six minutes to install. Putting it on there is pretty quick and then verifying and checking that everything's made it onto the board takes four or five minutes. So don't worry if it takes a little bit of time. Once it's finished, it'll reboot. You'll get that trilling noise from the Pixhawk to say it's happy. Yeah. Then in that instance, click connect and we can go on to our next stage. So here we are connected to the board. So you have to be connected because now we're going to try and configure it. And the reason this thing's flashing around the screen is because the GPS is trying to get its first ever GPS lock. And I would say that you need to give this time the very first time you power on the GPS. It can take anything up to 10, 15 minutes to get its first lock. And then from there on, it will be an awful lot faster. So we're not going to worry about that for now. What we're going to jump into is initial setup. And then we're going to go through each of the mandatory hardware pieces so that we can set them up one after the other. So the mandatory hardware, uh, we have frame type, accelerometer calibration, compass, radio calibration, flight modes, and failsafe. We're going to go through all of these apart from failsafe so that we're ready for the next video in the series where we're actually going to start connecting power and wire the Pixhawk into our quadcopter. So very quickly we'll go through these. So here we are connected to the board, we have the firmware on, we're going to teach it how we want it to be. Frame type, we're going to select the frame type we're interested in, obviously this is the configuration, it's an X type quad, so that's good. Accelerometer calibration, we're going to X teach the board what level feels like. So this is where the set square comes in really handy. We're going to start the process by clicking on calibrate accelerometers. We're going to place the vehicle level, and it is, press any key. Place the vehicle on its left. This is the front, so that's the left. Get as close to 90 degrees as you can. If you're not sure, use the set square to help you. Click done. Place the vehicle on its right hand side. Again, use the set square to help you. Click done. Vehicle nose down. Click done. Vehicle nose up. And while we're doing this, you try and keep it as still as you can while you're actually going through the process. Any wobbles can cause it to be unhappy. Place it on its back. So that's going to be that way round. Bit tricky this with all of the cables in it, but that should work. Click done. It's going to say calibration successful. So now the board knows what up, down, left, right feels like. So the next thing we'll go on to then is compass. So the next step is to calibrate the magnetometers or the compasses. Now there are two magnetometers with the Pixhawk, which is great because it means it's using both of them to establish its heading. And that gives you much better GPS performance because it knows its orientation as well as its position. There's a magnetometer inside the Pixhawk and inside the external compass. Again, important that we have the two arrows for the external module and the Pixhawk aligned. That way they are both pointing in the same direction. We're gonna select Pixhawk PX4. It's going to warn us and say you're on the latest version of the firmware. We'll say yes. And then we're going to click on live calibration. And what's going to happen, it's going to bring up a little screen that's going to show us the readings that it's getting from the internal and the external magnetometer. Now, as I move things around, you'll see it'll start to lock it in. And what we need to do is just keep moving it and moving that red dot until it hits as many of the white spots as possible. And you need to go upside down all the way around. There we go, we've got all of them. Now we keep going like this, uh, this little dance, until eventually the Mission Planner software says it's happy. There we go. And we have our offsets done. So there we have the calibration done for the magnetometer. So the next thing then is radio calibration. So the next thing we need to do then is power on our radio. As you can see the little flashing red light on the Tronus FR Sky receiver says we're not playing. I'm going to power on the radio. I'm just going to move this out of position so we can see what's happening. I'm going to turn on our radio. Welcome to Tyrannus. And the green light will come on showing us we have a connection. So now we're connected up to the Pixhawk. And on the screen, as you can see, we have all of our readings. So now we need to calibrate the radio. 
Just warning, we'll do a separate video in the series and I'll link to it in the description when it's done to show you how to set everything up on the Tyrannus. The only thing I'm going to do is just very quickly show you that the outputs for the PPM signal need to go aileron, elevator, throttle, rudder mode. A-E-T-R-M. If you do it that way, it'll work fine. So, what we're going to do move the radio in so you can see the sticks. I'm going to click on calibrate radio. It'll warn me and say I had to take off the props. We'll click OK. And now it's going to ask me to move the sticks to their limits and just go to the corners. You don't have to go crazy. Just make sure you're getting full travel on all the sticks, including the mode button. And while we're doing this, you'll see everything move in the display. It's a great opportunity to make sure that the throttle moves the throttle, elevator moves the elevator, your and aileron all work the right way. And I've got my mode switch set up, a switch five on the corner, and you can see that moving too. So click when done, it'll make sure that everything's centered, the throttle's at the lowest position, click OK. So now I have my radio calibrated. Last thing we'll do then in this video is then we'll calibrate the flight modes and we'll talk about those. So as I move the switch on the transmitter that we've set up for modes, which is the, the fifth channel, you can see that it's moving between three positions for flight modes one, four, and six. And if we just pull down on these, you can actually then decide on the ones that you want to pick for each of them. Now, there'll be a separate video that will go into each of the flight modes in turn. Uh, in the meantime, I'll link to the flight modes as part of the APM video series. Um, but if you want to see it quickly, it'll take me a week or two to get to this one. But I've got it so that it's stabilized in the low position, it loiter, or hang about in one place in the middle position and the top position gives me return to launch. Once you're happy, click save mode, that'll save it back to the board and it's all set. We could set up fail safe here, but we're going to do that in a separate video because that takes a little bit of time to do. But for now, we have our Pixhawk set up. So to just prove it's all working, we can see now that as I move the Pixhawk about, the artificial horizon is moving. We haven't got our 3D fix. I'm going to just leave it turned on, pointing out the window until we get our first 3D fix. And then when we come back for the second video in the series, we'll connect it up to a quadcopter that's currently running an APM. We'll plug in the ESCs into the back and we'll finish the setup, go through the final bits and pieces, talk about the arm button, talk about the buzzer, mount everything, and go for our first flight. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless 360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.